All right. Yeah. Okay. Hello, hello, hello. All right, no one yet. Oh, very important. Ooh, very important. This is, I'm telling you. No, today is episode three, season six. Very important to do. That is. Yeah. There you go. Done. Hello. Anyone? Hello, hello? Anyone there? No one in the chat room. Not, not good. Hey, Regal. Hey, Regal's 33. How are you? Okay. Hey, Z, uh, hey, Priya. Okay, uh, here's the drill. Before, before we start, mic check, audio check, 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 one, two, check, check, one, two, check, check. Uh, how does the audio sound? Video. We need to do a video and audio check. Check, check, one, two, check, check. Audio, mic. All right, Z, uh, Jumbo. Hey, hey, Train, how are you? All right, check, check, one, two, audio, ah, no, all right, you know what this means, all right, we're live, Oop. yeah, now we got to do lighting, the most important one is, if we're okay, if it, everything sounds good, mic-wise, video-wise, streaming-wise, it's time, hello, everyone, welcome to the third episode of Introduction to Security, uh, this is uh, my cybersecurity class at Tufts University. I'm Ming Chao, I'm associate teaching professor at Tufts. And today, it's we have a uh, special guest uh, by way of video. Um, the big topic of today is distributed denial of service attacks. Distributed denial of service attack, DDoS. Um, the idea of denial of service, DOS. Denial of service is well, denying legitimate users um, access to a resource or service. That's what it is. Generally speaking, the idea of denial of service is a bad thing. Uh, it can also be sometimes be a good thing as well, too. I'll give you an example. Uh, have anyone ever tried to buy, uh, anyone still looking for a PlayStation 5? And trying to get one online and then when you try to go online with like everyone trying to order at the same time you can't even get onto the website that's an example of an inadvertent and somewhat of a yeah I mean it's somewhat of a well it's not like malicious um, it's not a malicious thing but that's an example of denial, denial of service no one can get onto the website to actually order uh, a PlayStation 5 Happens all the time with Ticketmaster as well too. Unfortunately, the more common, uh, the more common denial of service uh, attacks uh, are usually used for bad, such as takedown of a business, causing mischief at a school. Um, usually, it has a very negative connotation. Now, so far, I didn't. I've only said denial of service, DOS. The whole idea, and more commonly, is. DDoS, a distributed denial of service attack. A distributed denial of service attack uh, uses, think of it this way, is using many computers uh, on the internet, usually like hack, like devices that are compromised, such as like webcams to conduct distributed denial of service. So using remote computers from all over the internet to create, you know, to cause a denial of service against the target. That's why it's called distributed denial of service attack, because you're using computers from all around the world. All right. So just a really, oops, just a really quick review. So that is what um, a distributed denial of service attack is. 
Now, the, like in terms of what we're going to do today is um, we're actually going to be using and writing code to actually show how you can actually do this. Now, I know this is Twitch. Um, this is just for educational purposes only. So today is going to be, okay, let's get into an understanding of how people actually would do uh, denial, distributed denial of service attacks. Um, we're going to use Python and Scapy as well. Um, and we're going to have a special guest, uh, John Hammond, who've done this for us at DEPCON, who've done this for us at DEPCON a few years ago. It's one of the best presentations I've ever seen. So just to review how uh, distributed analysis service attacks are commonly done, one of the most common ways, um, one of the most um, well-known distributed analysis service attack, and last Thursday, we did uh, Nmap. We did Nmap, and we, at the end, we talked about a decoy scan. So just a quick review of what a decoy scan and Nmap is. Here's the documentation again. And what a decoy scan is, the TLDR, it's a reconnaissance technique, it's a port scanning technique on Nmap that is a quote unquote, a generally effective technique for hiding your IP address. So the idea is you specify a whole list of IP addresses as decoys. So when you actually run the scan against a specified target, the target will actually see scans coming from not only you as the real attacker, but also uh, from the decoys as well too. So if you have 10 decoys, so the victim or the target will see 11 different IP addresses scanning uh, that target, but the target has, and the victim has no idea, like, oh, which one is who's scanning who, who's scanning them. But the caveat is, is that you got to use live IP addresses, live, I've not dead IP addresses, but live and up and running IP addresses on the internet as decoys. Else, you may accidentally sync flood your target. Sync flood is a very, very common, uh, very well known technique for distributed denial of service attack. So what a sync flood really is, is just flood a target or a victim with a whole bunch of TC uh, packet with TCP sync. That's what a sync flood is. So that is, this is, a, so later on, I'm going to show by code how a sync flood can be done. I spent a lot of time on Tuesday in the physical class talking about my absolute favorite and more commonly how it is done these days. Um, by way of amplification. Amplification DDoS attacks. So just a quick review of how amplification DDoS attacks actually works. And you're going to see this later on today in code. So the original amplification attack was called Smurf. Smurf uses the ping protocol. The idea is this. An attacker would actually tell a whole bunch of computers, um, no, uh, the attacker will send to a whole bunch of computers a ping, PIN uh, or ICMP request. Ping is really, really easy. It's really easy to understand. It's also very small. But the caveat is, is that the attacker, when the attacker sends a ping to each and every one of the uh, to, uh, remote computers, it will say, okay, the source IP address is not coming from me, the attacker, but coming from the IP address of the victim. So all of these uh, devices will send a reply back to, not to me, back at the attacker, but to the victim, because I specified in the ping packet, oh, this is coming from the victim. And so here's a diagram of... Um, a smurf attack. So here I'm the attacker. Here's a victim. The victim IP address is 9.9 is a is a 9.9.9.9.9. So the victim again, the victim IP address is 9.9.9.9. But I'm going to send each and every one of these devices, five devices, to each and every one of them to say, 
oh, you know, I'm going to send each and every one of these devices a, P, uh, a ping or ICMP, uh, ICMP uh, quest. But I'm also going to specify, yeah, but the sender of this ping is from 9.9.9.9, .9 the victim. So all these devices are actually going to just send a reply back to the victim. And the victim was like, WTF was like, boom, 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 getting uh, traffic out of nowhere from all these devices. Just a little fun fact, this smurf attack was actually used to take down the White House back in the 2000s. Fortunately, um, and this is actually the reason why a lot of systems now, including like Mac OS, Windows, um, routers, they block ping requests because ping has been abused for so many years. Ping has been abused for many, many years. So, okay, this is a grand old trick. You know, it's fun to understand. It's a precursor to what is currently done these days. Now, here's why, um, here's the thing. The reason why uh, Smurf attacks can happen is really because of a protocol like ping. First of all, ping is um, on layer three of the OSI model. There's no handshaking. That also means that you can actually, well, you can actually forge the source of the destination IP. You can forge the source and destination IP address and no one cares. No handshaking at all. So how these days are done is, well, we're not going to use ping, but why don't we actually use the same idea? But we need it to have a way where, okay, the, um, the import, the source and destination IP addresses can be forged. There's no handshaking. Uh, and furthermore, is there a way that we can get the response to the query significantly larger than the query itself? And the answer is, okay, the answer is yes. Well, first of all, what protocol is out there does not have a handshake? You know the answer is not TCP because we know the TCP handshake. So that means UDP, on the other hand, is a protocol that doesn't use handshaking at all. There's no handshake. There's no, like... The, you can spoof a uh, source IP address. Uh, UDP, no handshaking, is commonly used for a lot of streaming protocols, such as uh, streaming videos, um, like Netflix. Uh, it's also used for games. And DNS, uh, UDP is also used for DNS, domain, domain name systems. Okay, so domain name system, DNS, which is a telephone book of the internet, uses UDP, which has no handshaking. Okay, here's what is also beautiful about DNS, is that the response to the query is significantly larger than the query itself. So in this documentation, it's nice. So for example, you can send a tiny query where x dot x dot x dot x is the IP address of an open DNS resolver. How many characters is three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So, okay, you, you count the characters. And you can send this gigantic, you get this big gigantic response back and then you can send and then of course a computer or a remote computer that is used for a distributed now service that can send all this back to it and can go hammer a victim with that's a 64 byte query that resulted in a 3223 3, byte response in other words an attacker is able to achieve a 50 time amplification over whatever traffic that they can initiate over to an open DNS resolver. So here we are. We have talked about what a denial distributed denial of service attack is. That's pretty easy to understand. Take down a, a system or service on the internet. We've gone to not one, not two, but three different types of techniques for uh, you know to conduct how you do a distributed denial of service. Sync fraud. Uh, uh, Smurf attack and DNS amplification. That's three. So now, okay, how do people do this in code? Like, what do you use in code? Okay. So you may be wondering when we just talked about Smurf and we talked about uh, DNS amplification, they both had to rely on using packets with a spoofed source IP address. So you, the question now is, you may be wondering. Is there a way that you can write a computer program that you can spoof IP addresses of a, pa of a packet or create custom packets? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. So what we're going to now, 
do is we're going to use Python. Okay, if you have Mac OS, if you have Mac OS, um, I'm going to be using uh, my, my main machine is a Mac OS, so um, I use Homebrew to install all the stuff that I need. And the first thing is, if you haven't done so already, make sure that you have Python installed. Python 3 specific, uh, Python 3. So how you install Python on your Mac by way of Homebrew, and Homebrew will generally always install the latest software, which is nice. Back in the days, Apple, they would never provide you the latest version of any, like any tool. That prompted me for years to use Homebrew. So, assuming that you have Homebrew installed, to install Python on Mac OS, is brew install Python. So, currently, we're on Python 3.10.10, okay? So, I already have Python installed on my, on my, uh, on my, um, on my Mac. If you're on Windows, if you're on Windows land, uh, Python 3 for Windows, Python releases for Windows. Uh, you have, you can use, if you're on Windows, you can use either 3.11 or 3.10.10, okay? You can use either one. So, you need to, so just use the installer uh, for Windows here. So, that's the, that's step number one. Make sure that you have Python uh, 3 install Python 3 not Python 2 because we don't use Python because Python 2 were deprecated a, a year or two ago uh, Of course uh, you should install it within a specific directory so it doesn't come with the cross system version No, Python is not Python as a language is cross-platform But the installation is not cross-platform. I Hope that answers. that's a good question Zen so, Zan, Python as a language, okay, once you install Python on your system, is cross-platform. For the, no, for the most part. With some, like, minor, 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 minor operating system stuff. Generally speaking, Python is platform independent, as in, um, you know, the programming language, as you will see. But the installation process, that's different. That's, that's going to be platform. That's going to be different from system to system. If you're on Linux, um, you would use either apt-get or yum or app-apt to install Python. Okay. No, you don't have to install it within a specific directory. That's the other thing is that uh, you don't have to install it within a specific directory. Just go with whatever the default is. Um, go with whatever the default is. And now, after you have Python installed, all right, we're not done. The most important thing to install after after you install Python is Scappy. Scappy.net. Yeah. This is what we're gonna use today. Some people call it Scapy. Some P I call it Scappy for all these years. Scapy or Scappy. What it is, is a packet manipulation program. Uh, it relies on, it uses Python. So here's what you can do. So with Scappy, once you install it, you will be able to uh, create or decode packets with a wide number of protocols, send them over the wire, capture them, match replies, and much, much more. Um, you can write a lot of uh, classical tasks such as port scanning, probing, unit tests, uh, attack or network discovery, um, you name it. So essentially what you can do with Scappy is to write a tool like Wireshark or uh, DSNF or EaterCap or BetterCap, okay? Scappy, like Python, is also platform independently. It runs natively on Windows, uh, on Mac OS, most Unix. Um, yeah. So, here is how you install. Now, this is the same process. Generally speaking, how you run, um, how you install Scappy. You have to install Scappy now. The first thing that you need to do is to install Python for your system. But once you've installed Python on your system, you should have what is called a package manager. A package manager is 
every single programming language has what they call a package manager. What you can do uh, with a package manager for a um, programming language is to install like third party libraries that you can use for programming purposes. Uh, for, if you're familiar with JavaScript and uh, Node.js, uh, the Node.js package manager is NPM. If you're familiar with Ruby, the Ruby programming language uh, package manager is Gem. Now on Python, uh, the package manager is what they call pip. So if I do man pip, oh, okay. So there's no, okay, so it's not pip, man, it's actually pip3. Oh no, what the fuck? Okay. So pip3 list, uh, is this the one? Yep. So you would do either pip or pip3, depending on what you're saying. I think on Windows is pip, on Mac OS, on Homebrew, uh, Python installed is pip3. So what is pip? Surprise, they didn't give you the, the, the okay. Uh, here it is, pip, pip is the uh, package installer for Python. If I do pip, here it is. Uh, it doesn't give you that much. Yeah, pip on Windows. Okay. All right. So now, thanks, Puppet Sales. Great. Good to know. So what you now do to install Scappy on your system is pip3 install or pip Scappy. I already have it installed. Okay. Or again, if you're on Windows, it's pip install scappy. Either one. Okay. So they have uh, shell demos here. They have the document. This is like this. Here's the thing about the documentation. This is the official documentation. Um, what is on the installation page? Yep. Install. Yeah. Well, we're going to be using. Um, Yep. Yeah, don't worry about this. Don't worry about it. But I'm just surprised. It's not like they, they, they don't say pip install. Yeah, pip. Uh, Puppet sale. Try it on your end. Should try pip install. Um, pip install pipe uh, scappy. Okay. So once you've installed scappy, you can actually do the shell demo. So, okay, uh, you may not have time, but I'm going to do one for you right now. Okay, so once you've installed Scappy, one way to test out Scappy is, well, type in Scappy. Don't worry about the warnings and the info, no worries about that. Now you're going to get this screen. Welcome to Scappy. And what this is called, if you type Scappy on your command line, you hit enter. This is what they call interactive mode. Generally, you're not going to use this command line interactive mode. Usually, you will use, like, to write a program in Python using Scappy uh, as, a, as a library. You would only use this, what is called interactive mode or command line mode, just to do like simple tasks, like two to three line tasks. So what I am going to do now is just to show you a very simple example. Um, just a very, very simple example. I'm also going to use Wireshark for this. I need Wireshark to show you what's happening behind the scene. I got Wireshark here that's up and running, so I'm actually going to capture packets. I am not on Wi-Fi. I am on my USB. I'm actually a hardwired. So I'm going to be capturing packets. And here we are. This is all the packets that's on our Twitch stream. That's going on with our Twitch stream right now. But I also I only want to see, I don't want to see like the entire, all the uh, packets of this Twitch stream. I don't want to see this. I only want to see ICMP. Ping. Who the hell is sending me a ping system anyway? Okay. Weird. Why is there a ping that's happening all the... Okay, that's a strange one. Why? 
Why is there a ping happening? That is very strange. Alright. That's no fun. Let's stop this. I'm gonna quit. I'm gonna actually, okay, I'm gonna start continue without saving. Yeah, why is this happening? Why is there... Alright, that's a strange one. So, alright. Pip and Star Scappy. Are you getting smurfed? Um, who the heck is... Why is that happening? Why is that happening? Okay, I can actually do a further filter. Alright, IP.ADDR equals equals, yeah, I'm, I'm actually wondering, a stall fee, I'm actually wondering, like, what the hell is going on? It shouldn't be happening. But uh, I'm actually going to filter out more IP. I'm going to actually do 192.168.1.1. Alright. Alright, let's see if this works. Alright, so here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to, oop, not my calendar. Here we go. What's going on? All right, so I'm going to create a packet. Packet equals. So how you create a packet, I'm going to create a very simple packet. Now how you actually craft a packet in um, Scappy, some documentation on it, but the idea is um, it's very much like the OSI model. You actually will identify your IP headers and then your TCP headers. So what I can do is I'm going to create a new IP packet with destination, the destination IP equals inside a single quote or double quote, 192.168.1.1. Okay, so that's the destination. I'm not going to actually create a um, uh, any TCP headers for this. I'm just going to say ICMP for ping. So now what I just did here, packet equals IP, the DST, the destination equals inside of a string 192.168.1.1 slash ICMP. This is, we just created our very first packet. This is a ping packet. So what this packet is, is that it's going to be sent from my computer to the destination at 192.168.1.1, also known as my router. To send this packet, I just send packet and watch what happens. And notice, hopefully, there's going to be some things that you see in Wireshark. I haven't hit the enter key yet. Ready? Enter. Sent one packet. And there we go. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that, my friend. All right, so the source, my IP, my local IP address on my home network is 192.168.1.244. The destination is 192.168.1.1. I sent a request, I sent a request, and the reply is going to be 192.168.1.1, and uh, the destination back to my computer. Uh, yeah, so the router sent me back a reply. Nice. All right, but. Here's where the fun stuff actually. Now we're going to get to the fun stuff. So you may be actually wondering now, how do you forge, can you, well, how do you forge the source IP address? And how you do that in Scappy is, well, let's go back up. We can do packet equals IP SRC. Now the source is what I'm going to use for the source is going to be uh, my source IP address is going to be one. Uh, it's actually going to be the uh, Cloudflare DNS uh, IP address, which is one dot one dot one dot one comma DST equals one ninety two dot one sixty eight dot one dot one. This is going to be an ICMP packet. So what I just did is that I'm creating a packet that is going to be sent to my router. But the person who actually sent it, but the, actually the computer who sends it, not from my computer, is going to be 1.1.1.1. Send packet. Now watch what happens behind the scene. Bing! 
because uh, Wireshark, I set my Wireshark to be in promiscuous mode, you can see here it is, the source, 1.1.1.1. That's not me. I'm 192.168.1.244. Okay. Uh, 191.1.1.1 is Cloudflare, so it just sent an uh, ICMP a ping to my router at 192.168.1.1, echo. But of course it makes sense that there's no reply. I can't see if uh, my router actually responded to it. So here, this totally makes sense. I see the request that's sent from really my computer, but with the source IP address completely forged to be anything that I want. Send it to 192.168.1.1. Yep. Now, um, you may be wondering if I actually could see, like if my router actually, if uh, another computer would actually see something like this. Yeah, let's take a look. I sent one packet. So is there a way, you may be wondering, oh boy, here we go. Up a whole bunch of stuff. You may be wondering if there is a way that I can see, well, does like a computer that I got, uh, actually, can it actually send a reply? Actually, I'll just do one here. Instead of 192 to 168, uh, I'm going to do 192 to 168.1.10. Holy crap. This is actually my uh, DNS server. Okay, there we go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up another terminal here. Another, nah, no, not a tab. I'm going to open up another window. Uh, just open up base. Nah, not basic. I'm going to open up a brand new tab. Uh, nah, I'm going to open up a new window. New window profile homebrew. I'm going to SSH into my Pi hole, which is 192.168.1.10. Okay, clear the screen, sudo um, tcp dump minus i. Uh, so just to confirm that this is 192.168.1.10. Yeah, this is 192.168.1.10. Good. sudo tcp dump. So I can see traffic coming here. Uh, minus i eth0 icmp. So hopefully this will send all the ping packets. All right, good. Now we're verbose mode. So what I'm going to do is packet equals IP SRC equals 1.1.1.1. DST equals 192.168.1.10. So I'm going to send a ping packet to 192.168.1.10, but with a forged source IP address of 1.1.1.1. So let's see, hopefully all three windows will fire. I mean, all two windows. My Wireshark is going to actually send, show that the uh, uh, packet was sent. And my Pi hole will actually receive, will actually receive the ping. And it will actually send a reply to 192.168.1.1. Let's see if this works. I'll be damned. There we go. ICMP ping, all okay. right, from my computer, uh, you can see ICMP echo, that's sent from 192.168, from 1.1.1.1, sent a ping to 192.168.1.10, okay, but my pie hole, yeah, got it, look at that, look at that. My pot, my, my 192.168.1.10 not only did the request, but also get the reply. And my actual IP of my system, my system here, which is uh, 192.168.1.10, I think it was 244. Yeah, it didn't get show anything. Woo woo. All right. Again, the interactive mode is only used for certain cases. It's only used for testing and for like few lines of, of work. I don't need Wireshark anyway. I'm going to shut this off. Quit Wireshark. Yeah, quit without saving. 
I don't need this anymore. Thank you to my pie hole. Yep, two packets. Look at that. Two packets captured, two packets received. Sweet. All right, so I'm going to quit this out. You generally are not going to use command line mode. What's more uh, uh, common is that you write a Python program using Scappy. So for the next lab, for the daunting fourth lab in the security class, CS116, I know, and this made publicly available. Uh, lab number four is that you're basically writing um, uh, EaterCap, uh, and our cheaper version of Wireshark, which is called an incident alarm. An incident alarm is this. I'm going to send the link. And what this incident alarm is, write a program in Scappy that will detect the following. You need to, uh, using Scappy, right, using Python and Scappy, write a program, alarm.py, that analyzes a live stream of network packets or a PCAP file of, uh, for the following incidents. No scan, fin scan, Christmas tree scan, usernames and passwords sent and declared by way of HTTP basic authentication, uh, FTP, an IMAP, uh, Nikto scan, someone scanning for SMB, someone scanning for remote desktop protocol, also known as REP, and someone scanning for virtual, uh, for VNC instances. Uh, so that's what the alarm has to do. Fortunately, I have actually wrote starter code for each and every one of you, uh, for, for, for this, uh, uh, for this lab. Here is the starter code. And your job really is, do, your only job really is, is to modify uh, everything in one function packet callback. You don't want to be getting too pretty and write auxiliary uh, functions, because here's the thing that they don't teach you in programming classes. Um, when you add more functions, uh, more like, you know, more modularity, you actually slow down the code which is not good at all, especially if you're doing anything with networking, okay? Your only job is to, I, I, actually this semester I said, do not modify the code below. The only thing that you modify really is the stuff inside a packet callback. That's it. So now you may be wondering, all right, how does this thing work? Okay. Python code wasn't that, yeah, well, that's another thing. Python code isn't that fast to start with. That's another thing. That is absolutely correct. So if you actually want a stall fee, um, email me, and I have a really, there's a really long uh, article about, okay, Scappy is slower than you think. Maybe Scappy is sometimes not the best answer. If you're interested in that, write to me. I'll send it to you. I'll be happy to send it to you. I don't need Firefox anymore. Uh, I'm going to clear the screen, but I'm going to go to my desktop. And on my desktop, you see three files. I have alarm.py, which we're going to use a proposal I'm working on, and tufts.io-insecure.pcap. And so I'm going to use my favorite uh, editor. I'm gonna, I use Visual Studio Code from Microsoft. And there you go. Now, you copy and paste. This is the alarm.py that, uh, that I'm running here. Right, just to make sure that I'm running alarm.py. Yeah, we don't want to. Okay, there we go. I'm running alarm.py. That's on my desktop, just to be very clear. So I said, do not modify the code below. Um, so what this, uh, by default, what I provide is, okay, for packet callback, if the packet is, if you see a destination, if, if the packet is TCP, and a if, if, a, if it is a TCP packet and a destination port is port 80, then just print out, well, HTTP web traffic was detected. So let's actually run this code. It's going to run on, uh, okay, so you can run, there's a couple of ways to run uh, the alarm. So the first thing is you don't need road access, so it's just Python 3, alarm.py, minus i, and toughsio dash insecure dot pcap. See what happens. It's going to read through each and every packet in toughsio. There you go. It's going to read through all the packets, all 347 ish packets. And you can see port 80 actually in a bunch of them. So theoretically, we can actually, so ideally, we're going to see a lot of HTTP traffic detected, right? There you go. Web traffic detected. 
So it's going to go through, or it's going to open up toughsio-insecure.pcap. Yeah. It's going to open up toughs.io, uh, toughsio-insecure.pcap. Going to just detect if, well, if it's a TCP packet at port 80, it's a web track detected. So option number one is to read in a uh, PCAP file, which does not need root access. Now, the other option is, the other fun thing is, you can actually monitor a live network, a live computer network with the alarm. So you do Python 3. Actually, no. Because if you're going to be using a live network, it's going to be sudo Python 3 alarm.py minus i for the network interface and i am en5 i'm not mistaken hit enter sniffing on en5 so i'm gonna now open up uh, firefox and oh, oh a lot of web traffic installed so if i go to tufts.http colon tufts.io hit enter Oh, damn. Oh, that sucks. Toughshot.io is for sale? Oh, this is brand new to me. Oh, man. This, oh, man. That's devastating news. All right. Wow. All right. Wow. We still got it will work on a live network. All right, so what can you also do? Um, um, what can you also do with Scappy? So let's actually do a quick modification of this program. Um, and let's do, actually, yeah, why don't we just remove this? And why don't we just do stuff with like uh, printing out the TCP flags? Okay. So I'm just going to open up Firefox again. And I want to do uh, scappy.net. And I want to go to our documentation. Um, usage. Uh, we're going to use now the API reference. How about has underscore layer? So one thing is, hold on, let's while this thing is going, I just know this off the top of my head. If packets of TCP print packet sub TCP dot flags. So what this is, is if the packet is TCP, if it is TCP, then print out the flags. So what I will now do, is I'm going to clear the screen, and I'm going to do wget https download set1.pcap from lab number two. There you go. So I have set1.pcap now. Did I save this? Is it had layer? Damn. Why is this so slow? Well, that's disappointing. Anyway, so if the packet is a TCP packet and print out the TCP flags, hopefully this works. So Python 3, alarm.py minus r set 1.pcap. See what happens. Bing! Here we go. Let's go all the way up. Yeah, there's all the flags. And so look at all the way up, all the way up. Yeah, look at that. Let's go open up set one dot capital. We'll go to Wireshark. And open up set one dot pcap here and notice the flags. Sync, sync, ack, and ack. Yep, there you go. Sync, sync, ack, and ack. You see a PA, and a whole bunch of PAs here. 
A P A. A P A. Yeah, it looked like A P A. Yeah. All right. Looks like it's pretty equivalent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if you want to print out the source IP, uh, source IP, modify, modify that. You know, I just want to print a source IP. Oh. Uh, well, this doesn't make any sense. Because what it is, the SRC is not in the TCP layer, but it's in the IP layer. This should work, right? Bing! There you go. Well, you want the destination. So this is the reason why you want to actually use the TCP. You need to know the OSI model. There's certain fields exist in only certain layers. Like if you're going to get the source of the destination IP address, it has to be you have to look in the IP layer, not TCP. Not my calendar again. And this is only going to print out the, uh, this is going to print out the destination. Still looking, what the hell? Uh, if you want to print out the payload, if you want to print out the payload, packet sub TCP dot payload. This is going to be like uh, the text. Clear the screen, run it again. Whole bunch of raw. Hmm. It's a whole bunch of raw. Um, I forget what it is, but I do know that this is only going to print out raw. What happens if I print out raw? Like this. This is not going to have any mind problems today. No. There is a way. Uh, I actually wrote on a cheat sheet. Um, I'll provide the cheat sheet for the class on how do you actually get the payload in ASCII format. But yeah, so on a very rudimentary level, this is how you would use um, that you can write a program in SCAPI. But enough for me for today. What I want to do now is I want to turn it over. I now want to turn it over to John Hammond, who is going to talk about taking down the internet with SCAPI. Well, he'll delve a little bit more deeper than I will. Alrighty, hello everyone. Welcome. Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate you being here. This is a talk and presentation titled Take Down the Internet with Scapy. I'm presenting this as part of DEF CON 28 or DEF CON Safe Mode, and I'm here at the Packet Hacking Village. So let's dive into the presentation. But before we do, I've got to say this. I've said it before, I'm about to say it now, and I'm certainly going to say it again many, many times throughout the presentation. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Honestly, seriously, like, I know things are a little crazy and weird and not how we're used to them being at DEF CON, but thank you so, so much for being here. Thank you for tuning into this talk. Thank you for being a part of all this. I usually say this at the end, and I'm certainly going to, but now especially, I think it's really important. Just thank you. Thanks for being, thanks for being here. I really, really appreciate it. Okay. So the classic disclaimer, right? The start of every talk, it's just how it's got to start. These are my words, not my employers. I don't represent them. I'm not speaking for them, etc. These are just, this is stuff that I wanted to bring to you, me personally. Other disclaimer, don't or do try this at home, right? Anything that we talk about, anything that I showcase here, obviously it's a talk titled Take Down the Internet. Uh, don't actually do that or maybe do it at maybe your own small scale lab environment, etc. You can tinker with it and explore with it, but don't actually take down the internet, right? Cool. Next, your mileage may vary. I bring this up with everything that I kind of try and showcase. Look, I'm talking about it and I'm showing it to you. Maybe you'll have different results. Maybe something will work differently or strangely in the way that you do it if you do this sort of thing. I can't promise, and I don't mean to make this any written in stone gospel or anything, the stuff that comes out of this talk, it might be different for you and your mileage may vary. Okay, last bit, we're the good guys here, right? 
We talk about security. We talk about cybersecurity. We break things for the sake of making them better. We hack for good. And I want you to do the same. The stuff that we're going to talk about and showcase in this presentation, maybe it's a little bit on the different side of the fence. I want to re reiterate to you and kind of enforce it. Hey, hack for good. Okay. Obligatory introduction, right? Who is this guy talking at you? Hello, my name is John Hammond. Uh, I'll try and run through this quickly because I know no one cares, not even me. I used to just do some stuff with the Department of Defense Cyber Crime Center and their Cyber Training Academy. And I also work with like the Defense Threat Reduction Agency as a kind of a red team cyber operator. Right now, I'm working as a senior security researcher over at Huntress Labs. Again, not speaking for them. These are my words, not theirs. And in my free time, I like to play a little bit of capture the flag. I like to develop and create and host capture the flag events or competitions or exercises and training sets to try and make people better, to try and improve everyone's cybersecurity skill. Uh, on that same coin, I do produce some cheesy YouTube videos. I pr publish and showcase some capture the flag write-ups or programming tutorials, video guides, stuff like that. But that's all nerdy stuff that you don't really have to care about. Let's talk about what we're going to talk about. <laughs> kind of meta, right? So here's the agenda, the roadmap, the outline for our discussion. First, we'll lay the groundwork. We'll put down a little bit of a background, really set the scene for what we're going to be discussing. I'm going to be talking a little bit about Python, right? Python's kind of my weapon of choice, but we need to make a distinction between Python 2 versus Python 3 and what we'll kind of be using as our vessel throughout this talk. Then I'm going to introduce Scapy, one really, really cool Python module or library that you can pull into your Python source code, use with your projects, your other scripts, whatever you're working on to do really, really cool low-level stuff with network packets, with the stuff that you would find in PCAPs, if you would take a look at it in Wireshark or TCP dump, etc. We're going to do that with Scapy inside of Python. So we'll talk about how to install it, some documentation, syntax, and use cases, etc. Then we'll get into the real meat of the conversation. We'll talk about different attacks that we could perform, and we'll kind of zoom in or zoom out as appropriate on some of these different things. The ping of death, the sin flood, DNS attacks, BGP, etc. I do want to showcase a couple of IRL or in real life cases, right? Stuff that we've really seen out in the real world that is real. All about the stuff that we're kind of laying the foundation with here, Python, Scapy, and these network attacks when we're trying to take down the internet. We'll also discuss some of the defense and mitigation, some things that we could do, some things that we might consider when we take note of all these network attacks we're going to be looking at. Finally, I'll showcase some of the resources and references that I use to put together this conversation, this talk for you, and we'll have the boilerplate template slides, how you can contact me. And of course, I will thank you again and again. I'm really, really appreciative that you're here. All right, let's get into it. To get things rolling, let's lay the foundation. We're going to be talking about packets, right? We're here in the packet hacking village. We're talking about network oriented stuff. So naturally, we're going to be talking about packets using Scapy, using Python, and we'll dive into that more. But I want to say the title of this talk, right, the whole theme, take down the internet, that's going to be doing a lot of kind of jerk stuff. It's about obnoxious, annoying, adversarial, and disruptive attacks. So nothing like Elite, super cool, zero days, crazy, like, ninja warrior, cyber hacker stuff, but really just being mean and breaking stuff. We're trying to recklessly break stuff. I want to showcase some of this to you because it really I want to show you just how easy it is and how Python, just the same script and language that's about on every Unix system, can do this stuff and how you could do it if you really wanted to, but... You shouldn't. You don't have to, right? Take down the internet. Obnoxious, annoying, adversarial, and disruptive attacks. That's the background. All right, now let's talk a little bit about Python. I'm going to be using Python as the vessel for this talk, right? We want to make this a little bit of a technical talk and showcase some code, showcase some real stuff, rather than just pointing at numbers on a graph. So I want to lay the foundation again with Python. 
Python is a wonderful hacker's language. Yes, it's a scripting language, it's not compiled, it's read through an interpreter, but it is easy to read and easy to write. That means that it's super duper friendly, it's really easy to knock out quick testing scripts or to rapidly prototype some ideas. It's just handy and useful and has a lot of support between all the different libraries and modules and packages that you could pull into your code and do some really, really neat stuff. So there's some conversations, right? Because now we are in a new era. We are in 2020 and Python 2, the older version of Python is dead. It's not on the table anymore. Python 2 reached end of life at the start of this year, and now Python 3 is the officially supported version. Please don't hate me for screaming about that. I just want to make sure, hey, everyone knows we're using Python 3, and you should be too. And of course, Python is part of Linux. It is typically shipped and natively kind of built into a lot of common Linux distributions. And honestly, you should be using Linux. I don't know why you wouldn't be. And because it is part of Linux, it's really, really easy to access it just from the command line. You can simply type in Python, and then you're inside of an interactive shell or interpreter to work with the Python language. I'm kind of being explicit here. I'm using Python 3 with that suffix 3 at the end. You probably will just be able to invoke it as regular Python, and maybe that would spin up Python 3 for you. But if it does, fire up Python 2. Hey, you should know better. Go fix that up and hop over to Python 3 now as the officially supported version. Python, while we could be working inside of the language within the interpreter or within that shell, oftentimes you'll likely want to create a script or file with a .py extension, maybe a shebang line, and you can invoke it and run it with Python just as an automated tool, not manually working through the interpreter or the interactive shell there. In a lot of our conversations, what we'll be discussing, I am assuming you're going to end up using this inside of a script with a .py extension, and you don't need that interactive interpreter. Okay, let's move on, because you probably all already know about Python, and this is boring. So let's talk about Scapy. Scapy is incredible, fantastic, phenomenal. It is a module, it's a library, it's something you can just install, pull in to use with your Python code, and it gives you the ability to craft network packets. You can customize them, you can forge them, you can create them, you can, whatever you want, your wildest dreams, whatever sort of network layers or protocols or things that you want to use, you can get that fine tune, like zoomed in microscopic, customization of what that packet looks like. And that's super duper cool. It's easy to install. I'm showcasing some commands here. I'm assuming, okay, a Debian based distribution, maybe Ubuntu, you'll do a little sudo apt update and you'll install pip if you're working with that little handy Python package manager. And let's use pip install scapy. Now you could run scapy in one of two ways, very, very similar to what we talked about in Python, right? Scapy could be interactive and you could work inside of an interpreter with a manual, like typing in commands and getting that return back to you, like interactive shell, or you could work with it inside of a script and have Python just import Scapy as a whole module and you can access all of the code, the functions, the variables, all of that functionality that Scapy offers inside of your Python scripts, inside of Python. Now this is crazy cool, because we can work with TCP packets, UDP packets, any other network stuff, maybe CAN bus protocols or Bluetooth. There's so much more, and we could dive into some of the documentation for Scapy. I always want to point people to the real documentation, because that's where the real stuff is, right? I'm not going to be the expert, sorry. I don't think you would call yourself the expert. And I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm just trying to say the source code is the truth, right? <laughs> Documentation is the real accurate stuff. That's what's really there, really built in. And the official source is what's good to go to when you need help or you're trying to learn something new. Obviously, there's a man page for the command if you wanted to fire that up. Obviously, they've got an online web presence. You can check them out at scapy.net and they have official documentation over at readthedocs.io, and of course, a GitHub page. So you can go take a look at the source code. It's open source, it's awesome. It's all Python, good stuff. The website is actually fantastic. They have a page over there called Awesome Scapy, 
and that will showcase other tools, exploits, and some sample code to use, and it's really, really cool. They have some good stuff on Wi-Fi, like mapping and tracking Wi-Fi networks through 802.11, making a rowing access point, performing some man-in-the-middle attacks, some Tor onion router protocol stuff, tons and tons of great stuff, even CVEs and exploits for common attacks, or stuff from Crack, the attack against WPA2. Super duper cool. Really recommend you go check that out. Okay, now let's talk about the basic syntax of Scapy, because if we want to use it, we have to know how to. I say that Scapy is Pythonic in that the syntax that it uses when you're working with the module, you're working with Python objects, right? The same way most everything in Python really is, is that you're interacting and working with an object that has methods and properties and all these attributes and things you could work with that are really under the hood, right? Functions and variables just with a, a kind of a different decorated name. But being object oriented means we can do some kind of nifty things with it Maybe not all the time. I'm not trying to say OOP is the way, but it's nice to have that kind of built into the language when necessary. So you can see I'm working in like a little bit of a script here, right? I've got a shebang line set up. I'm going to work with Python 3 as my interpreter, and I'm going to use that from scapey.all import everything, or the asterisk, the star, the wildcard, to pull in everything that that scapey module has into my current namespace so I can interact with it and I can work with it through Python. So here I'm going to create an object or a little variable ping equals, and that the IP, this big class name, right, you can see the capital letters there, that's going to return a scapey object and it's going to be a packet and I can define how that packet looks. Maybe I don't want to use an IP or maybe it's that specific header for that protocol. I could zoom in on other things between TCP, UDP, HTTP or anything else and scapey already has support for all those crazy cool protocols and layers and you could just pull them in and work with them or if you really wanted to you could go do a little deep dive, get in the internals and build your own. So note inside here, I'm creating this IP object and I'm passing in a keyword argument. I'm saying DST or the destination, the destination IP address. I've simply set that to a string, 192.168.1.1. And I've had a little division symbol or that forward slash, which looks weird, right? Because we're not dividing these objects, but I'm using that syntax. And that is the syntax that Scapey uses to actually add layers in or kind of build them into that packet that we're crafting. So now I'm going to say, this is simply going to be an ICMP packet or ping packet, right? I've assigned that to that ping variable or the object, and I'm just going to print that out on the screen. If I were to run that script, check out down below. Now I have that kind of B prefix to note that this is a binary string or I'm just including real raw bytes here and that backslash X, the backslash X, everything, all those are the bytes to this packet that I've just formulated and created in a super duper simple way, right? It literally took one line of Python code and now I have a ping packet and I could do this. I could, I could send this packet. I could receive the information that comes back, maybe a little echo, a request, reply ping. That's very, very cool all in a script, all automated and extensible, whatever way that I want, and super duper short, right? One line of that Python code, easy to read, easy to write. Obviously, Scapy is abundant and there are more examples of this sort of thing on their website and their documentation. And that's really, really why I'm pointing you all towards it because that's where the good stuff is. We're going to cover some cool stuff in the talk, but if you want to go deeper, learn more, do some more research, I'd recommend, hey, go check out that documentation. Okay, last slide on Scapy, I promise, then I'll shut up about it and we can move on. I'm not trying to sound like an evangelist here, but I am trying to show to you all of the cool things that Scapy can do. Obviously, in this last slide, we just looked at a super duper small, minuscule example of one thing that Scapy could do. What we could do with that packet or with many other packets is put that together into a PCAP file, write it out to a packet capture archive. Or we could read in a packet capture archive or a PCAP file, read through it, loop through it, do interesting things with it. Or we could sniff and listen and actually capture live packets and dissect them or forge new ones, etc. 
with filters, import and exports, create graphs, reports, tables, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously all of those specific different protocols that we would wanna work with, we can. And then maybe we could turn it into more of the offensive side. We could probe or scan or attack networks, fuzz specific aspects of a protocol or send malformed packets. And we could do crazy tricks like, okay, art poisoning or do some specific kinds of scans, et cetera, et cetera. The benefit behind all of this, and this is what makes it so awesome, is that it can all be automated and you can write it and you have that fine-tuned control all within Python. You have the entire arsenal of the Python language and libraries, modules, other tools that you can use. Build this. X and I multiply it by this large number. So I have this data payload, this information that I've strapped to this ping packet so that I can send a ping of death that's just a little too big. And maybe that machine is biting off more than it can chew. It'll choke and it'll fall right over. I did mention though, that this ping of death attack is less common today, right? More so now you'll see other kinds of attacks that are still this denial of service attack, right? We're, we're being a jerk. We're overwhelming, flooding, and just bogging down the resources on that victim or target. So one of the more common ones you'll see now is perhaps an ICMP or a ping flood. And we can certainly send other kinds of floods. One of the most common ones you might see is a SYN flood. SYN flood is another denial of service or DOS attack, which will make that server, your victim, unavailable to respond. It'll be just too busy. It'll be bogged down. It'll be hosed because something will be consuming all of the available server resources. We're going to cause that by sending packets with that SYN flag set. So you know TCP packets, right? TCP being the transmission control protocol, which ensures there is a connection in place by using the three-way handshake, right? The client on one side of the conversation will send to the server a packet with the SYN flag set to synchronize or start the conversation and begin requesting communication. The server over on the other end of the conversation will say and respond back with a SYN ACK packet or a packet sent with those flags set. Finally, the client, knowing that the server has responded, that someone actually answered the phone, it will respond once more with an ACK flag set on a packet or the acknowledgement, okay, someone is listening and we can talk, we can have this conversation. Interesting thing though, on step two of that process or in the middle of the three-way handshake communication, the server, while it sends that SYN ACK packet, it will wait and wait to receive that ACK packet from the client so that it can begin having this conversation. So the attack is simple. We just send a ton of SYN packets where we're just starting all these conversations. We're dialing the phone, but once someone answers, we don't care. We don't respond to them with an ACK packet. So they're just, they're overwhelmed, right? The phone keeps ringing. Someone, they're going to pick it up and they're going to want to talk to someone, but no one will be there. They're just not having this conversation, but they're still holding the phone and more are ringing. That will hog all the resources that will cause that target victim to not be able to respond to other legitimate traffic because, okay, hey, they're busy, tied up with other stuff. All those resources are being utilized right now. Because this attack brings that server to the halfway point in the three-way handshake, right? They have started the communication but have not responded to the server's acknowledgement. That means that it's halfway communicated. That's why it's called that half open attack. It's kind of interesting. So let's take a look at the source code, right? Scapey again makes this super duper easy. We're performing this attack in realistically two lines of code that could even be shortened to one because hey, maybe we could abstract out that object that's not necessary for that sin flood. We could just pass that to the function. So I'm creating the sin flood object or variable, right? 
I send in a keyword argument for the destination. Again, just an IP address we'll use. We'll set an ID number for that packet and we'll specify the time to live. These values aren't extremely important for kind of just our discussion, but obviously that next layer certainly is. We create a TCP portion of this packet and that sport or S port is how you should read that for our source port. That's just going to be a random ephemeral port that Scapey will help us generate with that rand short function there. That'll return something that make, make it look like, okay, we're coming from a different port every time. The D port or the destination port will be passed in as a list or a little Python array. We'll just send this over to port 80 HTTP. You could specify this to whatever you wanted to, maybe SSH or anything specifically. Specify a sequence number, specify an acknowledgement number. Again, for this example, those don't really matter all that much, but maybe they could in other scenarios. The window size and the most important thing here, the flags that are set on this TCP packet. Obviously, I'm just passing in a string here with that capital S, and certainly enough, that stands for SYN, right? The SYN flag has been set on this packet. So we have created one packet that is just a SYN packet. The very, very first step in that TCP three-way handshake. The next line below, we're gonna end up using that SR loop function that Scapey makes available to us. And that is going to send and receive packets in a loop. So we will repeatedly over and over and over again, send this packet. The keyword arguments there, that inter or the interval, we'll send those at three tenths of a second. We'll retry every two seconds if that kind of gets dropped and we'll have a timeout of four seconds. Again, those are a little extraneous, but the point that we're getting across right now is that we are looping a SYN packet being sent over and over and over again. We are flooding that target victim server with this SYN flood attack. In the case of the line of code there, we have an answered and unanswered uh, information that's being stored as a return value of that SR loop. That'll just return a tuple, okay, or a list of what packets actually had a response and what didn't. The point that I'm trying to get across is that just these two lines of code are putting together this attack. And it's super duper simple. All you've done is outlined the structure. You've orchestrated this packet and now you can put it to work. You can weaponize it as a sin flood. You might notice though, in this example with this setup right here, we're sending this sin flood attack just with our attacker machine, one machine. So potentially that endpoint or that target, the victim server, once it realizes, hey, I'm under attack, right? I'm in danger. Just as you see the example there, we specify that DST keyword argument as an IP address string. We could just as easily specify SRC or the source IP address and make it look like we are coming from a different location. We can spoof our IP address super easily with Scapey. And we can use that as a segue into the next attack, DNS amplification attacks. A DNS amplification attack is a really interesting technique that abuses the regular functionality of DNS or the domain name system to again, overwhelm, spam, and flood a target or victim machine. The way that this works is that the attacker actually sends a legitimate regular request to a DNS name server asking for as much information as they can. So their request is a regular kind of small, tiny packet just asking for information and the domain name server will respond with as much information as possible and that way you get a much larger packet in response. The trick here is that with this DNS amplification attack, the attacker sets their IP address, the source, back to the actual victim or the target server that they're aiming to overwhelm and choke. You can see this here in the source code, right? We're defining, again, another object or variable to keep track of our packet. We're defining an IP header, 
But interestingly enough, we supply that SRC keyword value or the source IP address of the packet that we're going to be formulating. Note, this will act as our victim. This is the target machine that will have the domain name name server send back that large request. You can see again our division symbol or the forward slash to add new layers and we're adding a UDP packet portion, right? We'll set the D port or the destination port to 53, the default port for the domain name system or DNS servers. And what we're going to query from this DNS is anything we'd particularly like. Here, I'll just ask for anything regarding google.com or that domain. You could, of course, ask for any type or any resource record you'd like, an A record, a text record, a C name record. Generally, with this attack, you could expect to see the attacker request for any, as in return all of the resource records you could give me. We'll have that packet formulated, stored and encapsulated in that DNS AMP object and variable. And again, we will just send that packet along. The DNS server will respond accordingly. It will give all the information it can, but send it to that source IP address, not our actual attacker. That will flood and overwhelm, choke that target victim server. Obviously, you'd want to have more than one attack or one attacking machine doing this. You could perform this distributed denial of service, right? That DDoS or send this request multiple times. But I think this attack is really cool and really interesting, right? If you put it in kind of layman's term or a normal human explanation, say you are at the drive through ordering some fast food to go or whatever the case may be. Let's say you ask the person or the teller that's chatting with you and taking your order, I want one burger or I want one drink or whatever, whatever, whatever. Typically, that job of the teller will read back your order, right? So envision this scenario. You as the, the driver, right? You as the attacker, you say, I want everything on the menu. And then before they can read your, your order back to you, you drive away and let that next person go ahead and actually hear all that information. So while you just ask for a small tiny thing and a simple, hey, give me everything you've got, the next person or your target or your victim is going to be read and enumerated and receive all of the information. So maybe, I don't know what, a one scale for your packet could respond to a 10 in the response and what that teller will read out to that other person or that individual. Kind of cool. And obviously another added benefit to this is that the attacker is performing this attack indirectly. They make this request out to an open and accessible DNS resolver, and it will respond and just send that information out to the actual target or victim themselves. The attacker doesn't really leave any fingerprints or a trace on the target. It's not reaching it directly. It is an indirect attack. You can see that here again with that syntax, but as always, Scapy is making this really, really simple and honestly, really easy. Okay. Now let's talk about our finale attack. I want to discuss BGP abuse. So BGP is the border gateway protocol. And that is the standard routing protocol of the internet today. That means that it's actually telling your computers where these packets are going to go when you're working on the internet or at a large scale, the wide area network. 